Hey everyone, welcome to the third episode of Story Now. Today we're going to talk about Thor, The Dark World, and what exactly makes this movie lack much that's memorable, uh, and why that might be a problem for Marvel going forward as a franchise. There are a lot of, a lot of different reasons behind this, so let's dive right into them. The first problem with The Dark World is the formula. And this isn't to say that they apply the formula incorrectly or that there's something aberrant about the way Thor 2 follows up in, in the Marvel Universe. It's merely the fact that this is the film that, at least for me, shows that their formula cannot be used so often and continue to make memorable films. Now, when I talk about formula, I am, of course, referring to one of the two standard plots that seem to, to form the Marvel films. They're the MacGuffin. Now, the MacGuffin, uh, for those not used to the parlance, is, it, in essence, it's a plot device. It's an object of ill-defined power that uh, the villain wants or has and the hero must keep away from or take away from him. Uh, in essence, this then forms the conflict and the motivation for each of the characters all in a nice little box. They all want to get uh, X and keep X away from their enemies. Um, now, this isn't to say that that's necessarily a bad thing. In a lot of stories, uh, they've taken the MacGuffin in order to sort of simplify and sideline the traditional conflict resolution uh, core of a story and really look at some other things. Like um, a, a really good example of this would be the Lord of the Rings book series um, and the films where they they have the ring as the MacGuffin. It's ill-defined power that the villain wants. The hero wants to keep away from him. Everyone is sort of sort of motivated by, by it by, and by not letting their enemies have it. But that simplifies the plot and the motivations to, and, and the conflict, sorry, to, to one side. So you can really look at how, how people deal with these situations, how men are corrupted, how people find heart in the most horrifying circumstances and fight in the face of despair and all of that good stuff. It also allows you to see a beautiful world that's being laid out in front of you. Uh, and, you know, 1,500 other brilliant things in the book. But on its own, that's a very simplistic plot uh, device. And it's one that, that serves to dumb down the, the plot rather than give any sort of complexity like something like Cloud Atlas or Inception, um, where the plot is the main, the main thing. That being said, this MacGuffin plot device has been used in three out of the last four Marvel movies, and in two of them, the MacGuffin was the exact same object carried from one film to the other. And yes, you could say, okay, three films, that's not that much. But we've also been informed by Marvel that uh, the two devices, the Cosmic Cube and the, the powered red dusty, cloudy, liquidy thing uh, in Thor are actually two out of a set of six MacGuffins that all provide some ill-defined power, um, like the, the, the Cosmic Cube provi or Tesseract provided uh, energy and teleportation, uh, and the, the Red Aether provided power, uh, there are four others. There's something that provides power over the mind, something that provides power over the soul. There's a time-controlling device, uh, and, and so on. And all six of these will then combine, join their powers together, and form the Uber MacGuffin, the Infinity Gauntlet. Now, you know, very, very exciting if you've seen these things in the comics, the problem is that means that we're going to be locked into this formula for a while. And given that it's already starting to tarnish a little bit, that it's wearing a little thin, that not, may not be a good thing. We've, we've been as good as told that the plot of the, the third Avengers movie will, will revolve around taking this MacGuffin away from 
uh, the villain Thanos. Uh, we know that the other components of this are going to pop in, if not as plots, as subplots. Uh, and again, since they're ill-defined plot devices, it's pretty much a guarantee they're going to follow the same formula, that, that they're going to be people who, who take it and people who need to take it away from those people. Um, it's a problem, especially when you consider that every movie that doesn't follow this formula follows another formula, and that is the villain as a reflection of the hero. And this is actually where Marvel started, and this is what they were trying to get away from when they formed the MacGuffin plot. Um, this is Iron Man 1. You see the, the mechanical suit-powered Tony Stark fighting the mechanical suit-powered Obadiah Stane. You see in The Incredible Hulk, the hulked-out Hulk fighting the hulked-out uh, Abomination. Uh, you see in Thor, the Asgardian looking for his father's approval fights the Asgardian looking for his father's approval. You look in Iron Man 2, you see the, the arc reactor-powered irresponsible uh, genius Tony Stark going up against the arc reactor powered irresponsible genius Whiplash. Uh, Iron Man 3, you see the brilliant scientist using his devices fighting Tony Stark going up against the brilliant scientist using his advancements, um, the Mandarin. It's, it's every one of their films so far has been one of these two. On the other side, you then have Captain America and the Avengers following the MacGuffin plot looking for the Tesseract, and then you have Thor, the Dark World, looking after the Aether. It's just not enough. And in order to, 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 to garnish this, we, we're starting to have the movies converge. They're, they're all around this combination of humor and action, uh, witty one-liners, odd superpositions of normal life upon uh, superheroic battles in the background. And again, those are being overused. That's all we're getting. We, we saw that in Iron Man 3 and in Thor 2. The problem is those two franchises are supposed to be completely different. Thor, Thor was supposed to be much more Shakespearean, bombastic, and fun. And Iron Man was supposed to be wry and witty and, and much less sincere. But they're becoming the same film. And again, that's a problem. The films are fault starting to become formulaic, not just in their plot, but also in the way that that plot is garnished. Now, there's, there's one large problem with, with the dark world from a storytelling perspective, and that is what I'd like to call the mid-film refresh. Now, what do I mean by that? When the movie starts, we're introduced to Thor, who's our hero, we're introduced to Jane Foster, his love interest, and then we're introduced to a whole host of supporting characters in Asgard. We're introduced to the Warriors Three, uh, his his companions, and his most trusted warriors. We're introduced to the Lady Sif, who is a friend who clearly is it has has some interest in him and you know everyone was just like oh no a love a love triangle that's horrible but that that was the character that she was presented as uh we also had odin the father who was not too happy with with one son who didn't seem to want to take up res the responsibilities of the throne which is thor and utterly disgusted with the other son loki uh whom you know you all know is, is a bad apple now, all of these characters are given screen time enough for them to be prominent secondary characters. And all of them are given some reason to have an arc. One of the Warriors Three wants to, to stay home with his people, help them rebuild after the fallout from the, the destruction of the Bifrost. Uh, Lady Sif, she, she starts to become resentful of Jane Foster when brought in, and... Uh, and also, you have uh, you have Odin and and Thor's mother, who both would like him to be with a not like would like him to be with a fellow Asgardian, not a mortal, and and really look upon Lady Sif as as a proper match, and all of that stuff. Again, romantic romantic stuff that most people would not prefer to see in the movie, but it's there, and it's there for a good 40, 50 minutes of the film. Then, right in the middle of the film, the action shifts. Uh, some, some 
battle -y stuff happens, and Thor, Loki, and Jane Foster set off to to fight Malekith, the, the Dark Elf. After that happens, we never hear from or see the characters in Asgard again. Every single one of these characters who we had been given scream time, who had been given character characters, proper characters, not just characteristics, and some 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 con some form of conflict, um, with the remainder of the Warriors Three actually having fought Asgardian guards in order to help Thor escape, and they're never mentioned again. They're never seen again. Nothing nothing becomes of those stories. All those arcs are immediately aborted. And we go to Earth, and all of these new characters come. We have we have Darcy, the the is she an intern or is she a, a co-worker? It's not really explained. Uh, of Jane Foster, you have her intern, some British fellow. You have uh, the the crazy the crazy scientist who was in the first Thor and is was in the Avengers, and these characters, you know, then they start their arcs and kind of finish them. But we never really get back to those those first characters. Our investment never pays off. And again, that's horrible. You don't... If you're going to have characters incidental to the story or have them not really pay off, you shouldn't play them up so much. Instead, you should use that time to play up characters who will have an arc, who will have a plot... That way, the audience is kept invested in characters who will reward that investment. And and they didn't do that here. And that, just from a storytelling perspective, is is a major disappointment with this film. So what was it about Thor that made it work as a film? That, that made it worthy of having a sequel uh, in a way that that The Incredible Hulk apparently wasn't. Uh, to a large extent, this was that it was a really sincere film. Uh, when you look at, at, its, at its predecessors, which are pretty much the Iron Man series, those were all, all really wry and dark, but Thor wasn't, and it provided a really different sort of feeling. Uh, this was a world that was that was silly and just fun, and it knew it. It had characters that were completely invested in in their world. They never they never second guessed it. They never doubted, uh, you know, the authenticity or the goodness of of the world or their pursuits. Uh, you had the Asgardians who were just this this incredibly bombastic Shakespearean fun people who who were constantly upbeat and partying and you know full of joy de vivre then you had earth and you had these scientists who were constantly exploring and who were really just trying to put the the, the pieces of the cosmos together and when these two interacted there was no hint of of irony or cynicism these were just people who who really believed in where they came from, who really believed in the world they were in. And because of that, they were allowed to be fun. They were allowed to, to, to be funny in a, in a genuine way rather than in a cynical or sarcastic way. Uh, the problem is, in the dark world, the world becomes dark. Uh, pardon the pun. Like, even the... And this is visible from the cinematography itself. Like, they stick dark filters on it and so now, Asgard, far from being this shiny techno-utopia, now looks like a building out of a Game of Thrones with magical laser lances thrown in. Uh, you look at Earth, and instead of being this, this vibrant suburban community with a couple of nutball scientists, it's this really dark and rainy part of London. It's... And... and the film carries that through. So, I mean, I guess on one hand, you have to compliment them on being totally consistent. Uh, the world is darker. You see people hurt, get hurt, people die. Uh, there's mourning. There, oaths of vengeance are sworn. Uh, one character is, ha, has gone insane. Um, you know, uh, uh, Natalie Portman, who plays the, the love interest, uh, Jane Foster, her character is consistently 
jerked around and and full of doubt and all of those fun things, which is a little strange given where she was left at the end of the first film, really hopeful and, and looking to find Thor. Um, overall, the world is 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 much less light, much less fun because it's much less lighthearted, and because of that, it loses the the thing that the the quality that made the first film really enjoyable, and it, it, because it's trying to be like Iron Man and like the Avengers, it's trying to be dark and jaded, and these characters don't work in that setting, uh, and not only that, we've seen that that that's. That is Iron Man, all, all three Iron Man films. That is the Hulk. Uh, that is, to a certain extent, Captain America. That is totally what the Avengers were. And given that, it, it's really difficult for them to succeed this way. Especially when, as I said, the characters are not organic to that setting. Now, there, this movie isn't all bad. There are some definite great parts. And... One of them is Loki. Now, this isn't just because Loki is just such gloriously unrestrained id. This isn't because he makes all of those those quips and uh, and sarcastic jibes that that sort of bring the, bring the characters in into some form of relief, uh, or the fact that Tom Hiddleston is just fantastic. It's actually about his storyline, and to be honest, if that had been the main storyline in the film, this film would have been a lot better, because this is gold. We see Loki here having, having been defeated and humbled twice now, and he's in prison. He's, in essence, he's the lowest of the low in Asgard, uh, and, you know, only his mother really cares at all about him. Uh, and and takes the time to to sort of visit him in in some way or another, uh, but otherwise we see him trying to cling to his pride by by laughing at and mocking his captors and uh, trying to maintain this sense of otherness while still reaching out to his to his mother. And mid film, uh, he t makes a really interesting turn and actually hits rock bottom and. Surprisingly, this isn't this isn't because he does something that's really aberrant to him. It's more because of what happens to him. Um, I'm I, I'm not gonna exactly tell you what it is, but um, it's it's really interesting to see and how he sort of tries to mask mask his uh, his pain at first and ends up teaming up with Thor, and and helping him do all of the all of the dark plot related things he has to do, and. Uh, Towards the middle, he uh, towards the middle of of this collaboration, he he actually apparently goes goes down for the count, and this is this is actually really affecting because it seems like okay he's he's maintained this throughout this this sort of moral ambiguity. You don't know if you should trust him or not trust him, and actually the way he goes down is is pretty heroic, um, until the end uh, when you realize that that he may have been playing a bigger game. And the ending is is beautifully ambiguous. Because at the end, you're not sure if his his final appearance is, you know, his his complete act of atonement, that he's actually actually become the a, a whole human being because of of the events in the film or if he's just been gaming the system the whole time and that's really good storytelling when you have a character that throughout leaves you doubting his his moral stance and whether you should trust him uh has a moment where you think that he can trust him only for him to die and then he comes back in a position that either makes him seem like the biggest hero of all or one of the most brilliant manipulators of all time that was exceptional, and and you really do have to give the Dark World points for that aspect. So on the whole, this isn't a particularly memorable film, and that's partially because it doesn't live up to the first film's 
uh, theme and its flavor, uh, partially because it's just yet another example of uninspired plotting, and partially because they they really made a mistake by it, having the audience invest in characters only to drop them completely midway. Uh, that being said, this film does provide Loki with a really interesting arc, and that alone is, is probably worth watching the film once for. But beyond that, you probably won't remember much from this movie. Uh, it doesn't age well, and honestly, it, it may actually spell trouble for the franchise, given that this is the first direct sequel uh, after Iron Man 2. And uh, while not as terrible as Iron Man 2, it does, it does fail... For, in almost an identical fashion. It's ter terribly unmemorable. It trades substance for, for one-liners, and uh, it's just an example of really bad storytelling. Um, so that's it for Thor 2. Now, uh, coming up in the remainder of the month, I will give a... Uh, I will look into Person of Interest, why that show is probably the best drama that's on television and likely one of the best that's been on in a while. Uh, I will look into uh, the desolation of smog and why it makes complete sense for a 200-page book to be three films that are over two and a half hours each. Uh, and I'll start the next year with a film on Cloud Atlas and why that's probably one of the most underrated films in the last three or four years. Uh, that's all for now. Bye and see you later.